So um, The Go-Between was a novel that was written more than 65 years ago in England and it's probably most famous for a particular line. It's often used out of context but it feels that it has a real resonance at the moment and that the line is, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Now it feels that this really resonates with where we are if you're involved in education in any form at the moment. Um, so if we look at your classroom, our classrooms as they were in February, January, maybe March, um, what are your memories of that place? If you can think back to what it looks like, you probably maybe sense the smell, maybe you left physically left some things there that you need to go and get back eventually, but maybe professionally you feel that you've left some things behind and you haven't been able to access them remotely. But I think what's clear from everything that's happening across across the globe in every school system is that those months ago they are a bit of a foreign country and the traditions are slightly different it's that the idea of going to a strange country and seeing things that are done differently so when we go back there do we have the work permit the visa to go back and just carry on as we were or do we need possibly a new set of skills and that applies of course to many of us for our personal lives and our professional lives um, but also will definitely apply to our students who will have been affected personally by bereavement or by changes in circumstance or by being isolated um, or maybe financial hardship uh, people who bring in an income in the house might not have jobs anymore and it's going to massively affect our students ability to engage with what we're teaching maybe even to be in school and we need to really be able to be responsive to that because we know but what we're in now at the moment, it may feel like for some of us it's coming to an end. But we know if what we read uh, around the globe is anything to go by, that it's likely that we'll have further disruption in months and possibly years ahead. So with that in mind, I want to give you probably three tools um, that you can use and to steer your remote practice um, and your remote learning. Now, it may only be two. You may choose to reject one. That's fine. It may only be one. You may not be able to implement two of them. It may be zero. But if you come up with your own, do try and write them down. Do try and get an understanding of, of what you're doing. Or pass these ones off as your own. I really don't mind. So the first one is, is I would say, if I had a soapbox that I would carry around to every meeting, to every interaction with anybody involved in teaching um, online or, or thinking about online learning, is that make informed decisions would be written on the side of that soapbox. Um, particularly when any decision you'll make, when you make when it comes to thinking about uh, teaching and learning, you're deciding, for example, if we look back at previous weeks in this series, um, you've, you're using a survey in a Google Classroom, for example, to find out how your students are doing uh, emotionally, to maybe help them access the curriculum in subsequent weeks. Now, you know why you're doing that, but you need to be able to articulate that for other people. You need to show that you made an informed decision. If your school is maybe saying, well, every week you need to have a, a Google Meet, a Hangouts Meet with your students and you need to spend an hour in there and everybody needs to be there. Now, if you've done that once or twice, maybe you did it once and improved it, tried to improve it, didn't work the second time. If you say no, you need to make that informed decision and you need to be able to document why you aren't doing it because your colleagues will learn from it. This is really important in a school context. Um, but also you can learn from it and maybe you can revisit it later on. But making informed decisions either way, whether you're doing something or not doing something, is really critical. I would say that it's as bad to be an advocate for new things from an uninformed position as it is to reject all sort of new things from an equally uninformed position. So you may be one of the people, you may not feel like it, but you might be one of those people who likes trying new things. You may, or you may have colleagues who are those people who will never do anything new. I don't like this new stuff. I've been doing it the same for 25 years and I'm not changing now. Now, either of those positions may wind you up um, and may just annoy you or irritate you. But actually, I think it's really important on us as professionals to apply that same critical reasoning that we'd want our students to apply in their studies as we do in our professional lives. And that kind of relates to the second skill I'm gonna give you. And this is quite, quite short. Um, but actually has a lot of implications. And I always say this, the most important skill to do with technology that you can have as a professional is knowing when not to use it. To make that, again, it's an informed decision, so it kind of comes from number one, but it's knowing when to say, I'm not doing that. Now, you might have been sent an email from your principal or your supervisor saying, I've seen this school across the country is using X to do this. Why aren't we doing this? 
And again, that informed decision making from point one really comes to this, because if you can say, I'm not doing this because you save yourself a lot of time, I'm sure if you think maybe not that carefully, you can probably think of some tools that you've been told to use, mandated to use by someone, maybe possibly someone senior in the past, and um, you spent more time learning it than you ever did using it. And depending on your personal circumstances right now, you may be looking after family, you may be struggling in all sorts of other ways, while at the same time still having to carry out your teaching duties, then you know that time is precious. And so you want to start making, again, those informed decisions, but being able to say, I'm not doing that, is a really powerful thing. And it's also powerful in a school context, because if you're seen, and you might not feel like it, but if you're doing this, at all, you may be seen as an advocate for doing online teaching and exploring online learning by your colleagues. And if they can see you, maybe they look at you and go, well, she's always doing the new stuff from an informed position. But maybe if, if they see you turn and say, I'm not going to do that, it's not going to work. It's not going to be worthwhile. All that effort I'm going to put in, I could do it more simply in another way or not do it at all. That will give them the confidence to say, OK, I need to understand more of that because actually it will make you a more rounded character in there. You're not just the advocate who says if it's new, we're doing it. You're actually providing that much more thoughtful um, uh, approach to new things. And the other thing, and this kind of again follows on, is make what you're doing understandable for everybody involved. And in that, I'd include your colleagues. I'd include anybody who's supervising you, who may be measuring your performance or what you're doing. Also, your students and their adults as well. So it's often they're really about um, showing, not just telling. So if you've got really clear outcomes and really clear educational objectives in mind, then you can start to put things into a perspective that people who, quite frankly, you know, we've spent in this series quite a bit of time in some of the blog posts showing you links to how to do things, for example, in Google Classroom, some quite detailed videos. The people who are supervising you don't need to see that. They just need to really understand what it is, what, why are you doing this? What are the outcomes you're looking for? And what are you hoping to achieve using this? How are you going to measure this? It won't necessarily be, well, I could click this and click this and I was able to create a spreadsheet. That's not really where we're at. But actually, if your outcomes and your goals and your metrics, if you like, the things you can measure um, can be in terms that they understand, you'll get more support, you'll get more understanding, and you'll also get a lot more um, engagement from people who maybe think, well, seems slightly geeky, I don't know. Um, but I think it's a really powerful thing to to have and to be able to advocate for. And also for your students, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because of this, because of these reasons, and for their parents, their carers. Why, why, why is my son or daughter only doing this online? Well, we're doing this because, and that's that explaining the why is really, really key. Uh, now, for the next months and possibly years now, it's quite possible that you and your students might oscillate between your classroom and their homerooms with varying frequency. I don't, nobody knows, but it's likely to happen. And so I think it's really important that we uh, equip, our skill, equip ourselves with those skills to be thoughtful, considered and informed and take those quite deliberate steps towards trying to weave things weave a golden thread if you like through what we do in the classroom and what we do online um, so that we can ultimately help our students be stronger and more secure in what are by any accounts uncertain times.